Gentlelady yields back, Mr. Buck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you for being here, uh, Mr. Bondrum. I, I am trying to uh, figure something out. What is the purpose of these cyber attacks on Colonial Pipeline, JBS, Solar Winds, et cetera? In, in a in a short summary. Sure. Uh, two different. Uh, point. So on solar, wind, I'm sorry, on uh, JBS and on Colonial, it's pure financial gain for a criminal element. On solar winds, um, you know, the best answer I can provide you, it's obviously Russia state-backed activity to see what that software as a service and supply chain attack could get them access to that would be of interest to them. So perhaps U.S. government information where solar winds is a software platform uh, in any number one of the departments but it would be an access point so that they could exfiltrate or find information that's of interest to them. So uh, there have also been attacks, cyber attacks on OPM, on government agencies, um, gathering data about United States citizens and, and former government employees or uh, for other purposes. I assume that some of the cyber attacks on banks, um, other institutions, give the cyber attackers the ability to gain information about uh, U.S. citizens. Yes, sir. And I'm also assuming that at a time of war, uh, that could be used to destabilize our country. I, certainly that's one of the potential uses, yes. And, and so we really have sort of two categories, if, if I'm not mistaken, and I appreciate Mr. Shabbat's questions about how this money can be used to uh, further the enterprise. When Procter & Gamble makes toothpaste, they sell it, and they're going to be able to make more toothpaste. When these folks um, receive money, they're going to be able to invest um, in, in maybe more intricate equipment or, or more people and, and continue their activities. But there's also this national security implication where U.S. citizens are vulnerable as a result of all of these, not all of these, but some of these attacks. Yeah, I think that when we look at Russia specifically and their targeting, but if you're okay with it, I'll expand it to China as well. When we look at their targeting of what I'll call personally identifiable information, that is something that they're going to take back and utilize to craft a more, a more overarching campaign. It's very hard for me to say what those are uh, here in this moment, not because it's classified or unclassified. We just don't know how they're going to potentially use that information. You know, I could come up with a use case in my mind that says perhaps the Chinese are using it in the criminal underground to uh, generate income off a of U.S. PII, right? I mean, there's any number of use cases. So I think your terminology of destabilizing is absolutely fair, but it's very hard for me to be precise about exactly what they're going to do with that information. Well, here's, here's the issue, I guess. We, we know that uh, part of uh, a future war would be attacking the infrastructure of another country. And so if Russia had the capability to shut down our electric grid, um, or our airports, or whatever it is, our banking system, um, they, they, if, if there was, in fact, a war, we're, you know, obviously we all pray there ever is such a thing, but if there was, um, that could be. But it could also be to uh, make sure that uh, Thomas Massey, for example, wouldn't have access to his bank account. There's a lot of money in that bank account, I understand, and so uh, <laughs> if, if there is uh, that... Um, Type of, uh, and what I'm wondering is, is there that type of individual capability to uh, not just take uh, out an infrastructure system, but also um, affect individuals, whether they're in leadership positions in this country or not? Yeah, so we have seen leadership individuals targeted precisely, right? We have seen the primary, you know, you can name them, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, take precision action to compromise an email account, to compromise primarily an email account as I'm working through it in my head of all people that we all know the names of in this country. Um, but for the average American, um, what we see of both the state actor side and the criminal side is overarching campaigns to have the most disruptive capacity that they're capable of, not really precision targeting a Mr. Massey's bank account, okay. independent of the amount of money that may be. Well, up. I'm sure he finds that uh, uh, comforting. Um, I guess my last question uh, is, 
what can Americans do? Obviously, these major companies have staffs and they can, can take care of themselves, or maybe not. But what can Americans do to protect themselves from uh, an attack like this? Yeah, I mean, two, two basic things, right? Ensure that your operating system on your home computer is upgraded. Um, to the most current operating system, whether that's traditional Microsoft or Apple. And number two is uh, two-factor authentication on all your accounts. Never use the same email or the same password on any accounts. And like, think about it this way, right? If people did open source research on me, they would understand where I grew up, probably could get my wife's name, probably could get my brother's name, probably could understand where, I, where I've lived, where I've worked. Well, that's largely what people use for their passwords. And so if you do life-based profiling around that, you can really narrow down how to break a password. So really obscure passwords and long passwords is very good advice. Thank you for being here, Mr. Chairman. I yield back.